Okay, so welcome everybody. This is uh, another AAM workshop. This is our Farmed Animal Rescue Workshop. This workshop is hosted by Animal Activism Mentorship. I'm Michelle Granberg. I'm moderating tonight. I'm a mentor and team member of AAM. AAM is a global nonprofit. We're building a worldwide community of activists and creating more effective activists. AAM matches existing mentors with new mentees. Mentors share their experience and knowledge with newer activists so they don't feel alone and also to inspire them to do more. We also offer workshops like this that train and educate our mentees and the public on the various aspects of activism. So tonight's topic is all about animal rescue. We know that farmed animals are stuck in an exploitive and deadly commercialized profit-driven system. We also know that compassionate rescuers are on the front line witnessing firsthand some of the worst, most horrific and heartbreaking scenarios and take part in removing animals from these often life or death situations and getting them to a forever safe home. So uh, in our workshop, guest speakers, Sarah and Melissa, will be talking about what animal rescuers do, the issues they encounter, what we as vegan activists can do to support animal rescue, and they're gonna share some real stories from their many years of experience. So we're very excited to learn. Um, stick around to the end, please. We will have time for questions and answers at the end and some announcements about what's up with AAM next. And also just to let you know that we are recording. You might have already gotten the notice on that. So with that, I have the pleasure of introducing our first guest speaker, Sarah Windle, founder of Farmshire Animal Sanctuary, a nonprofit animal rescue in Waynesville, North Carolina, that rescues abused, abandoned, and unwanted farm animals. Their website is farmshire.org, and we're gonna put that in the chat, farmshire.org, if you wanna reach out to Sarah. So, Sarah, you ready? Take it away. All right. I hope you all can hear me okay. Um, first, I want to thank AAM and the individuals that put this together, like Michelle and Trey and Mikey, and I'm sure so many other people that kind of made this happen. I know it takes a lot of work, and thank you so much for putting it together. Um, I also want to thank Melissa, my co-speaker tonight. It's been uh, really great to connect with her in the past week and um, preparation for this evening. And she definitely has a whole different approach. And I really respect the work that she does. And I hope you stay tuned after I speak to hear um, what she has to say, because she's very knowledgeable and has a lot of really good information to share. Um, and I want to thank all of you that have logged in tonight. So the fact that you're here to me means you're really cool people. And I really regret that we can't all connect in person. Um, hopefully in the future we can connect in person. But for now, we're going to have to connect from um, behind our computer screen. So um, connecting and farm animal rescue is really how we share information. Um, because it's really, there's no how-to manual for how to rescue farm animals from the food system. So what we really rely on is connecting and sharing our experiences and like what's worked for each other and um, learning from our mistakes. So um, the fact that you're interested in this is really cool because there's just not very many people that care about these issues. Even within animal rescue, most people care about dogs and cats and maybe horses, but um, rescuing animals from the food system is something that takes a lot of courage. And thank you for being brave enough to kind of dive into a field that is so devastating and like so emotionally exhausting. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing um, some situations that we would like, why are we presented with a situation to even rescue an animal? So there's billions of animals every year that are being slaughtered. And how do we even get the opportunity to rescue even one of them? So 
Uh, one situation is a willing surrender from a farm. So we've got an animal agricultural in, um, a system that's uh, willing to surrender an animal. So they might do that because uh, maybe an animal has poor genetics and is not making good babies and they're just not profitable for their, um, for their operation. Or maybe they connected to one specific animal and they want to pardon them. And I've worked with farms that really kind of take advantage of this and they'll really blow this up and they'll make themselves into the hero like oh we surrendered this one animal like look what we did and then meanwhile they are slaughtering literally that um, animal's family members so this becomes kind of a tricky situation of like how to work with farmers in a way that um, you keep open communication but don't perpetuate the problem so um once you take an animal into like your custody or get them to sanctuary, we have control of that narrative. So you might have one tone when you're negotiating with a farmer um, for that end goal, which is getting that animal liberated. But once they're in sanctuary, you can completely tell the story, you know, how you want and how you see fit for that animal's situation. So, um, but another issue is like paying for animals. So everybody has a different line they draw here. So we personally don't pay for animals. We don't use funds from our 501c3 to um, monetarily support the continuation of these operations. But, you know, some rescuers will. And I can't say that there aren't situations where this needs to happen. I know the animals here that I've learned to um, grown to love as family members. Obviously, if today I had to pay to save their life, like I would. Um, but yeah, it, it becomes a tricky thing. And there's not really a lot of judgment there. You just have to kind of gauge when you should um, be paying for an animal. So another situation is when a farm animal enters the shelter system. So in North Carolina, the state law is that animals or farm animals are supposed to go to auction. So it's the same as if like the county acquired a car or something. They're trying to recuperate um, money for the county. So most counties really don't abide by that and they'll allow a rescue to go in and pull an animal. But um, some do and I've definitely had to go to auctions to rescue farm animals. Um, so they might come through as a stray or just like an owner surrender. And the number, like the two animals that I definitely have to rescue from shelters the most are potbelly pigs and chickens, specifically roosters. Um, so the potbelly pig crisis, about 90% of potbelly pigs purchased from breeders are gonna be surrendered before the age of one. Um, and oddly enough, this is how I got into animal rescue is I impulsively purchased a pot belly pig from a breeder, thought she was gonna be this um, perfect little house pet and she would be litter box trained, and, um, have really good house manners and she ended up not. So I adapted to the situation and got um, a place with a yard. And then later, because I formed this intimate bond with her, I actually got into rescue because of her. But most people don't do this and they dump them in a shelter or however they can. Um, some even just let them loose and they become strays. Um, another thing is the, the rooster crisis. So backyard breeding is a huge problem. Definitely in Asheville, it's like a trendy thing to do to have a backyard flock. And especially this time of year, you go in tractor supply or a feed store and there's these cute little like peeping fluff balls and people just box them up and buy them and take them home and don't really think about the fact that um, like what they're going to need for lifelong care. So they're usually not prepared to deal with roosters. Roosters aren't providing eggs. They're not really doing much for them. Um, maybe a rooster is aggressive because they're doing their job, which is to protect the flock. Or maybe people aren't zoned for roosters, um, so they are trying to surrender them. And even within sanctuaries, roosters can be problematic because Usually the types of um, enclosures that we have, you'll have like hens and one rooster and you can't really put multiple roosters in one enclosure. So um, 
you can only take so many. And a lot of sanctuaries are starting to do these bachelor flocks, which is a really great idea. And if anybody has a yard and can take on a few boys, it's um, hugely helpful if you can take on some roosters because they are very underrepresented even within farm animal rescue. And then there's owner surrenders directly, um, people trying to surrender directly to a sanctuary or an individual. So a lot of this is just saying, um, you know, unfortunately we can't help right now and give us some time to kind of network and figure this out. And sometimes just taking a step back and kind of saying, this is gonna take some time. And these individuals realize this isn't something you can just dump off and solve in like a day. Um, the wills in their heads start turning and they might be able to solve this situation for themselves and figure out how to keep the animal in their home. And then there's open rescue, which is probably something you all, a lot of you are interested in. It's um, definitely intense and exciting, um, but there is a lot more to it than this like original rescue. And so, that's what I want to talk about a little bit is this concept of like, what is an animal's rescue story? So a lot of people think it is this uh, dramatic scenario of like, you go in, you take the animal from the abusive situation. And of course, we all love to see that. That's exciting. Um, the animal is being liberated. But I really think we need to kind of shift this narrative and understand that an animal's rescue story continues way past that um, initial rescue and that they need lifelong support once they're in sanctuary. So um, they're gonna need lifelong care. Sometimes it turns into like a hospice situation. So if you see a sanctuary that's fundraising for like end of life medical needs, you know, pay as much attention to those pleas for help as you do the original, um, you know, fundraiser rescue story, because they really do need our lifelong support. Um, it's really, the rescue is from, is their whole life really. And I really encourage um, all activists to get to sanctuaries and spend time with these animals because that bond is so important and it's so therapeutic and healing and we really need to develop these bonds with these liberated animals. Okay, so what can you do to help? Um, so if you hear of an animal that needs rescuing, you can definitely contact sanctuaries. That's a really good first step, but just go ahead and assume they're probably full. Most of us are full. We can't keep up with this demand. So we're gonna start using our networking skills to try to find placement. And a lot of this is where you can step in and do the same things that we do and maybe take some of that um, work off of us. So sharing on social media, um, I know a lot of us are super connected online, but like you might have a whole different network than I do, and you might share it and the right person sees this animal that can offer them a home. Um, so sharing as much as you can, fundraising for their medical needs, um, this is a huge thing. So if someone's offering a home or considering offering a home to an animal, they're thinking about a million different things for this animal. And if you're able to say, hey, we raise funds, we're gonna cover that spay or neuter, that initial vet appointment, then that could make a difference in like a yes or a no. Offering to volunteer for building projects if needed. Um, often somebody says, hey, I have the land, but my fencing needs repaired or I need to put a structure up or something like that. So saying, you know, I'll come there for a day and help with uh, whatever projects you need help with helping with transport. Um, there's a lot that goes into this. I know Melissa is going to um, talk about more of the details of kind of the safety risk and like biosecurity and quarantine and all that. But as far as um, being able to like logistically do like a cat carrier, you know, go to a shelter and pick them up, or you could pick up a pot belly pig with a large dog crate in an SUV. As you get into like large animals needing 
um, to be in a trailer, that's going to be a whole different situation and you need to have the right vehicle and knowledge about how to load an animal. Um, screening potential homes. So definitely this is something you need to work with someone with experience or some type of mentor if you aren't aware of what this particular species needs. Um, it's not as simple as, oh, I know this person, they're vegan, they're a good person. Um, you have to look at like, can they provide a good home for this animal? And then there's fostering, which I put a little warning sign with because it's not the same as fostering like a um, kitten or a puppy. Like if there's not an initial lifelong home found, then sometimes if you take the animal into foster and you don't have something lined up, you can end with up with them for a very long time. So about half of my population <laughs> that I have here now is actually, they were fosters originally. So they're just lifelong fosters apparently. Um, but sometimes this can be a really valuable thing and it could be, I've definitely held animals while another home is getting ready to take them. And um, it's been like a very temporary thing, but it's something you wanna consider because it's just a little different than dogs or cats. And all of this is kind of coming into the central theme of like animal rescue as mutual aid and really getting away from this idea of like a nonprofit industrial complex where there's just a few of us sanctuaries and we have all the resources, but we also have all the burden and we have to do everything because um, we, we really just can't. But as individuals and as a community, we can come together and we really can save so many more animals because I guarantee each of us has a little skill we can offer that could help an animal get a home. Um, so. Okay, so this is just an example of kind of what a collaborative group effort of mutual aid would look like to rescue an animal. So this comes from an actual rescue that I've done. So um, I, this is a timeline of the rescue. So Humane Farm offers to surrender a farm pig to a sanctuary and they give a two week time frame till slaughter. The sanctuary cannot take the pig but offers to advocate for them. So you respond, quick email, we can't take them, but thanks for reaching out. Give us some time. We're gonna see what we can do. Animal's safe for now, we're working on it. Um, finds a home through networking and screening. So all of you all come together, sharing a million times, somebody's able to help that animal. Um, someone launches a fundraiser for medical expenses. So this home that's offered to take the animal doesn't even have to worry about that bill. There's been a fundraiser launched and they're able to cover that entirely. A separate organization steps up and offers financial assistance for fencing. So this particular home had plenty of land, but no fencing. So another organization said, we can't take the animal, but we're happy to donate for fencing. And so they called in, paid for the supplies. We went and got them, um, used volunteers to set up that enclosure. So the home that um, had stepped up to take them, this would have taken them a week to build it. We assembled a work party, got the enclosure done in about a, um, in like a day. Transport assistance organized. So we were able to tell the home, hey, we've got a trailer set up. We're gonna go pull the pig from the farm, take him to his neuter appointment, pick him up, bring him back to you. They don't even have to think about that. So in the end, this is a collaboration of eight individuals and three different organizations to save one pig. Um, you're probably thinking this is a ton of work to save one pig, but um, Obviously it's worth it even to save one life. And also the idea is that he then becomes an ambassador and he, his story will be told for years to come and hopefully inspire others to make different choices, um, different food choices and not contribute to this massive problem. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about um, using your resources to make the most maximum impact. So 
you and you alone are responsible for figuring out what you can do and how much you can do. And this is as an individual that's just trying to coordinate rescues or as a sanctuary. So it's really important you learn how to manage your time and your resources and know when to say no. So you can't save every animal. And the sooner you learn that, um, the better it's gonna be for your mental health, the better it's gonna be for the longevity of your animal rescue career. Um, because we want, we want to be in this for the long haul, right? Like it's not, you know, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. So learning when to say no, um, learning when to say, I can't even log into Facebook and see another animal that's about to be killed, or like, I don't want to check my messages right now, or as a sanctuary saying, I don't, I can't take on anymore. Um, so learning when to say no is super important. So as a sanctuary, it's important because you can cross that line into being a hoarder really, really quick. So nobody goes into this and says, I'm going to be a hoarder. Like, it's, it's that you just got in over your head. So learn to say no before it's too late. Um, and the way I look at it is I'm saying no, not just for myself, but for all the animals in my care and because it will negatively affect them if I take on too much. And then like time management even, um, you know, if you wake up and respond to like every buzz and ding on your phone, you're completely surrendering like your time and your day to other people and you're going to get tugged in a million different directions. So if you get known as an animal rescuer, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this. It's going to be urgent situation after urgent situation. And unfortunately, it is always life and death and you can't always respond to every life and death situation. And so just being aware of that and like having compassion for yourself in these situations. Um, and then with sanctuaries, like if you're going to take on animals physically, figuring out a number beforehand, before this emotional tug of these individual stories comes into play. Um, when I got this farm, I was like, this is how many animals I can take on this acreage. And I made that decision based on the fact that I wanted each animal to have like year round grazing. Um, and that's not like completely necessary. I've seen sanctuaries that have really great setups and they're on more like dirt lot enclosures, but they provide enrichment and keep them super clean and maintain and they do a great job. But it was just a personal thing for me that I wanted to see the animals grazing and um, getting those biological and psychological needs met. Um, so figuring out a number and like sticking to it if you're gonna take animals. And then I um, wanted to talk a little bit about adaptability and knowing how to respond to situations around you. So if you're gonna be an activist in general, you need to learn how to kind of analyze what's going on and respond accordingly. So um, times of crisis can really change everything. So what this looked like for us the beginning of last year, 2020, is we sat down as a board of directors and we planned out our whole year and it was based on events and tours and school groups and come March, everything shut down and it was just like a completely different situation. So we had to adapt to that and compensate and how are we going to generate revenue um, based on these different circumstances around us um, and your priorities will shift according to kind of what's happening. And then as like a personal rescuer also just realizing there's no blueprint for a rescue and knowing how to adapt to each situation. So um, me and Melissa were talking a lot about this and I'm going to use an example paperwork and a case study, but you know, you might have one animal rescue and you want to blow it up before it's even happened. Like I want to publicize this, like we're going to fundraise. We want to talk about this in real time, like as it's happening. And then you might have a story that like, you can't really talk about until after it's happened. You wanna talk about it in retrospect. And then you might have an animal rescue that like you can't talk about much at all and their identity needs to be more hidden like for their safety. So kind of knowing when to 
do different things. And a lot of that you don't even know, you might make mistakes and you don't know until you look in retrospect. Um, but hopefully we can kind of learn from each other's mistakes with those things. So I wanna talk about advantages and disadvantages of having a 501c3. So having nonprofit status is a lot of extra work. Um, and most of us don't get into animal rescue because we just wanna do a ton of paperwork. Um, but that's what it can look a, lot, look a lot like. So for me these days, it's a lot of administrative stuff and keeping up with what the IRS wants from me. And um, that's not you know, exactly what I wanted, but that's kind of what you have to deal with if you have a 501. So what are the advantages of it? Um, there's not as much like tax benefits as you would think. Like if someone's making a big donation, they might care if you're a nonprofit because they can do a tax write-off. But in general, like most donations aren't really even um, accounted for like that. But I think it really legitimizes you. And when I go to work with shelters or different operations and I can say I have a 501c3, I think people they take you more seriously and are more willing to work with you. So I think that's the main benefit of it. But as an individual rescuer, just kind of like piggybacking off another person's 501c3, like we don't all need to run out and get incorporated and get our 501, but working with one could really be beneficial to you. So I wanna do a case study about paperwork and talk a little bit about that. Um, so I am like a huge stickler on paperwork and here is why. Oh. Okay, so this is a specific case study of something I have went through, a court case I dealt with a few years ago. Um, and I don't wanna talk about names of different rescues, so kind of bear with me and I hope it's not too confusing, but I'm gonna to refer to them as rescues A, B, and C. Okay, so the situation is an individual surrenders two piglets to a 501c3 animal rescue. We're gonna call this nonprofit A. No surrender form is used. Nonprofit A dissolves and animals are absorbed by another nonprofit, nonprofit B. General paperwork is used to sign all animals over um, from A to B. Nonprofit B decides to no longer do farm animal rescue and transfers all of the animals to nonprofit C. A transfer agreement is signed between the two parties. So all animals and assets go there. So the original owner wants the pigs back to put in a petting zoo and takes legal action to do so. So obviously this individual is wanting the pigs to put in a petting zoo, nonprofit C is like, hell no, legal action is pursued. The court rules that because no paperwork was originally obtained, all contracts were null and void and the pigs were pulled out of sanctuary and put in a petting zoo. Um, so even though proper legally binding paperwork was signed in two, between the two different parties, the original surrender form was not signed over, so everything was null and void. So kind of a depressing situation, but if that original paperwork was obtained, none of that would have happened. So because that was kind of a depressing story, I was just going to show you some of my animals because they're adorable. Um, and just kind of end on like talking about why sanctuaries are so important. So we know that we're only able to rescue this tiny percent of animals. So like, why is this even important in the big picture? It's because their, their storytelling has such a strong emotional pull. So we all know, unfortunately, that logic doesn't resonate with everybody. If it did, everyone would be vegan. We wouldn't even need to do this work. So we're trying to really go at it from a different uh, point of view. And these animals are really able to connect with people in a different way than we are. So I'll see it when I give tours, like they're not hearing my statistics and my numbers and my logic, but then they sit with Gilbert, the pig, and they rub on him. And um, I, I talk about his story and what could have happened to him. 
and it, you can see it like that connection. There's this emotional pull that like, I can't give these people, but the animals can. And it's really just creating an intentional space for the type of world that we want to see and making farm animal rescue not an abstract concept, but showing like this is how it's done. This is how they should be treated. And of course, we can't provide this type of sanctuary setting to the billions out there. Like it's, there's not enough land, there's not enough space or resources, but hopefully stopping this like very cruel, unsustainable system. Um, and really just starting to see sanctuary as a form of activism. You know, there are these people that are taking care of animals day in and day out in this mundane caregiving routine. Um, it's really revolutionary and it is direct action um, and we need to treat it as so and really like talk about it more. And making a daily commitment to these animals is just being part of the solution. Um, and it's an intentional act, just like being vegan is. We're making a choice several times a day about what we're gonna consume um, and that's revolutionary, but so is going out on your farm and caregiving for animals several times a day. It's huge. Um, and also want to talk about micro sanctuaries and just that not every, if you're going to take in animals, it doesn't have to be on this large scale. I'm sure a lot of you have a backyard and you could provide a home to a few chickens or like one pig or, you know, rabbits are used for meat and just trying to make a commitment to actually seeing companion animals is not just these traditional animals that um, are typically treated with compassion. And then I just wanted to end about um, with giving you all some links of how we can connect as a community. I don't know if somebody, one of you like has something to show, but the ones I use are Emergency Vegan Action Squad, Farm Sanctuaries Unite, and my website, um, farmshire.org. Does somebody have those to put up somewhere? I'm dropping them in the chat here. I was just going to say that. I'm sure Trey will put them in cool. the chat. Write them down, folks, before they disappear. <laughs> Is that, are you done, Sarah? That, that was, yes? Yeah. That was so good. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. That was really, wow. That was excellent. That was a ton of information and just, just so rich with tips and excellent points and great things to think about. And uh, I'm sure everybody has tons of questions already. So just hang in there, remember your questions, write them down and Sarah's going to be able to answer them. Uh, but now we're going to go to our next, um, I'm going to introduce our second guest speaker tonight. Um, her name is Melissa Majen, and she's from Rock Hill, South Carolina. Melissa has been involved in some sort of rescue for over 30 years, whether it's been cats, reptiles, or in recent years, farmed animals. Her experience lies mostly in the area of pig rescue. As a former director of rescue for Cotton Branch Farm Sanctuary, she developed an integrated program for rescue, foster, transport, and placement. Since striking out on her own in 2017, she has worked collaboratively with numerous sanctuaries, organizations, and individual rescuers to make all the components of successful rescue come together for the animals. So I'm gonna, Melissa, are you ready? I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank yes. you again, Sarah, great. Okay, so bear with me on the technology as we uh, started this earlier. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you, Sarah, for your great presentation. And what I'm gonna touch on will be um, a lot of the things that Sarah has talked about. I'm just gonna like drill down into a little more detail on certain aspects um, with particular focus on transport and um, placement and screening homes. And I'm gonna mainly um, share information through personal stories and case studies. And I'm sorry to tell you that a couple of these are gonna be really depressing and don't have good outcomes, but I think we need to examine these because this is how we learn. We learn when we fail. 
And so I do want to share some failures with you. And, and then I'll I promise <laughs> that I'm going to end up on a lighter note with some happy stuff. So, so bear with me on that. Um, I'm going to try my screen share here and get a presentation up. Well, no, I'm not getting it. I can try to get it up on mine real quick. It's Think. Now it shows up. Okay, do you see it? Yes. Okay, let me just move this up where I can see it. Um, so the first picture I have up, this isn't as slick as what Sarah did. I've been having some tech problems here, so. Um, but I've got a picture up and you know, this is really cute, right? <laughs> this is the kind of picture you see on Facebook a lot. Um, and by the way, I want to say that the friend who let me use this picture, um, I did get her permission for this. And she's a really good sport about me um, pointing out why I have a problem with it. But this is your typical, um, you know, cute Facebook selfie, transporting an animal in the back of an SUV or, you know, something. And I see this a lot and um, I find it very worrisome. So I want to start my transport talk with some basic safety stuff and, and why something like this is so problematic. Um, you know, and the first thing is this animal is unsecured. Like there's no barrier. Um, I hope most of you, when you transport your cat to the vet, you put the cat in a carrier. And if you're transporting a dog, you put the dog in a crate or you have some kind of restraint system for your dog in your vehicle. Um, certainly when you're transporting your child, you put the child in a car seat. And the reason for a goat or a pig are exactly the same as for all those other animals. Um, if you are to get in some kind of an accident, this animal is going to become a missile going through your windshield. And I don't know if you've ever had the experience of witnessing an accident. I know you've probably seen pictures of, you know, transport trucks for farm animals, you know, the big truck with 2000 piglets on it. And there's an accident and it rolls over and there's piglets running around the interstate. But that happens on a smaller scale. And, you know, I've, I've per personally seen um, accidents and seen, you know, a dog running around the highway that wasn't secured. So always secure the animal. Um, there needs to be some kind of barrier. I mean, and there's also, besides the accident, there's an issue with how an animal is going to react to being transported. You never know how the animal is actually going to behave. You know, a lot of times, you know, they just curl up and go to sleep, everything's fine. But now and then you're gonna get an animal when loaded in a vehicle that freaks out. And even in a crate, it can be problematic. So that's another reason why you don't want the animal to have any possible access to the area where the driver is. So that's just something to keep in mind. And, you know, if you volunteer for transport, make sure that you can do that safely. Um, as I've said, a lot of my experience is in the area of pigs. Um, and I work with both big farm pigs and little pot belly pigs. I love them all. Um, so with a, a small pot belly pig or even a farm pig, if it's young enough, you know, if it's a piglet, you can transport them in an SUV in the uh, XXL size dog crate. Uh, but even then, I've seen cases where a pig would get upset and they can break one of those crates very easily. 
Um, so whenever I've transported in a crate, I make sure to reinforce that crate with um, heavy duty nylon straps. Um, I use the kind that you use for tying um, kayaks down to a roof rack because I happen to have a lot of kayaks, so I have a lot of those straps, but they're very strong. And I put those going all around the crate in every direction, um, especially over where the door is, but, but also all the way around and also like over the top and under the bottom uh, to prevent the animal from breaking through that crate and then possibly, you know, being loose in the vehicle. Um, so I'm going to um, move on to another picture. Um, so this kind of looks like the same situation. Um, and this is a, um, this is a transport that I did. Uh, this is a young calf. His name became Van. Um, and this is kind of a, this is a sad story. But, um, so Van was one of these um, dairy calves. It was surrendered by the farmer, a uh, male dairy calf. And um, he was part of a group of, of several that were surrendered and were placed, um, I wasn't involved in the original surrender or placement at all, but they were placed at a vegan sanctuary. Um, the cows were all sick. Um, and that's something you have to keep in mind with farmed animals, especially when you're you know, actually rescuing from a farm, commercial farm situation, is that there are a lot of diseases present. Um, because this calf was so sick, well, um, when, when it came time for me to transport him, he was originally at this vegan sanctuary and the whole group of calves were sick. And a lot of them were moved, um, you know, eventually to a vet. And then from the vet, they were moved to a university vet uh, because the local vet couldn't care for them. Um, the situation was extremely grave. Um, so when I was told about this calf, um, I was willing to transport him, and um, I originally didn't know that he was sick, so I offered to transport him in a trailer and was told, no, he's like so sick, he needs to be in a climate-controlled vehicle, uh, which is often the case. So um, I reached out to a friend, um, happens to be Rick of Changing Hearts Farm. Uh, he said I could use his name, and this is his van. He owns a uh, carpet cleaning business and they have cargo vans. And so instead of putting the calf in the back of an SUV and he's too big to go into a crate, um, I used Rick's cargo van. So this is what you see from the driver's seat. And because it's a cargo van, it has this grate that's going all the way across uh, between the cargo area and the driver and passenger area. So that protects the animal from going, you know, possibly through the windshield and it protects the driver from the animal possibly breaking into that area. Now, um, there's another thing about this story. Um, these calves were very, very sick and um, it, I'm really sad to say that um, most of them did not live and Van here did not live even after he got to a vet school and got, um, you know, advanced care. He was, he was in like an ICU in isolation. Um, a number of the diseases that farmed animals can have are transmissible to humans. And they're also of course transmissible to other animals of the same species and across different species. Um, so it's really important when you're transporting to be aware of whatever illness might be present. And if you're, if you're out there as a rescuer asking for help with transport, uh, you need to be really honest with somebody who volunteers if there are health issues going on um, so that measures can be taken. And this, also becomes true because we're sharing equipment a lot between um, one rescue and the, and the next. So Van here 
Now, I was kind of lucky because I was transporting him from one vet to a vet school. And when I got to this vet, now this, this is recent, um, so it was during COVID and uh, I got to this particular vet, like, you know, it's the only, I've, I've been to a number of vets during the pandemic and they're all, you know, most of them, it's like you drive up to the curb, you don't go in the waiting room, you know, everybody's masked, they come out and we'll get the animal and you can't even go like back into the treatment area. This vet, nobody's wearing a mask. I mean, when they handle this calf, they put on masks, gowns, and gloves, okay? Because this calf was contagious to human beings. And so if a vet that doesn't believe in COVID <laughs> is taking those precautions, then I'm gonna take it very seriously. Um, so I didn't handle this calf. You wanna, I mean, it's so, you want to love on the animal, you know? But when you're dealing with a sick animal, um, you need to protect yourself and your passengers. And so the vet loaded the, the calf and I drove the calf to the vet school. And at the vet school, the uh, vets there greeted me once again. They're, they already knew what was coming. They were gowned and masked and gloved and took the calf right into their um, isolation area. I later found out that I was the only person who transported one of these groups of calves who did not get sick. So I hope you'll take this seriously and um, you know, really pay attention to possible health issues when you're doing transport. And then the next thing is when I returned this van, um, I told my friend Rick, that you know this calf was really sick, couldn't be handled, and I said, you, you know, you're going to need to disinfect the entire inside of the van before any other animal can go in it. And he had the equipment to do that, so it's fine. But um, another thing is when you're sharing equipment between rescues, um, you need to like really get things clean because. Diseases can be transmitted. Um, there's a wasting disease common to ruminants, which can live in dirt and feces for a couple of years. Um, so definitely with that, that's an issue where, um, you know, sharing, like having the same species or similar species, just ruminants, in a trailer one after another uh, could cause the spread of that disease. It's a fatal disease. So you really want to be conscious about that. So um, just to summarize some of the um, transport considerations. So like I said, securing the animal so that both the driver and the animal are safe. I prefer to use a trailer, um, but sometimes, you know, with smaller animals, it's not that practical. Um, but with large animals, I'm you know, always using a trailer. Um, you have state and federal regulations. Um, so I do want to mention that when you're crossing state lines, uh, even when you're not, um, you need to know what the requirements are and they're going to be different with different species. But generally, um, you need some kind of a health certificate. And the way you do this is you go to your vet who needs to be a qualified large animal vet. You know, you can't just go to your dog and cat vet, but um, you need to go to your vet and the vet will contact the state veterinarian. So every state basically has a state vet who's responsible for overseeing the import and export of animals um, for their state and responsible for these regulations. So your vet will contact the state vet and find out what is required. So for some species in some states, it's gonna vary widely. Uh, there might be a blood test required, um, you know, just different things. And there's always some kind of ID required, which is where we get into things like ear tags, um, which a lot of states you just have to do it, an ear tag or a tattoo, or um, a lot of states will let you do a microchip now but generally, if you're doing a microchip, you're going to need to have a microchip reader 
in the vehicle with you that can read that chip because you can't expect that whatever, you know, cop or agriculture person that you're dealing with is going to have a reader that can read whatever chip you have. So you need to have that chip. And I especially want to mention Florida because I see it a lot, people wanting to transport in and out of Florida. Florida is an exceptional state. Um, I don't know of any other state that has this, um, but Florida is a big agricultural state and there are uh, diseases that are there that aren't elsewhere that need to be contained and also diseases that aren't there that they don't want getting in. So they're very, very strict about animals coming in on any paved road going in or out of the state of Florida, there is an ag station. And you don't even have to have an animal with you. If you are driving any kind of um, trailer, uh, any kind of enclosed trailer that would include a U-Haul, any kind of cargo van, you have to go through the ag station. They have infrared cameras there, so they will see if you have an animal hidden. So there's all these stories about people trying to get a pony out of Florida in a U-Haul trailer. Well, you're going to get caught. Uh, they also have on each side of the interstate, there's about half a dozen patrol cars lined up at the ag station. If you try to just go past it and not pull over and go through, they're there to chase you down. So you really need to be aware of that when transporting into or out of Florida and you need to have your paperwork. Um, it's the same process, you know, your vet will call the state vet. Uh, you're required to get an import number and that will go on your health certificate and you have to have ID and they do accept a microchip. But you have to have the chip reader. And it's pretty simple. You just pull through and you go show your paperwork. Sometimes they might like, check the IDs. I've never had them actually check it, but they do look at the paperwork and you know make sure you have the IDs and then they let you through. So that's um, something, you know, in the case of Florida, it's a felony if you pass the ag station without, without pulling into it. Um, so that's another thing I just, when I see people asking for volunteers to transport, and they're asking to go to Florida, well, you know, your volunteer needs to know this. So, um, you know, anybody transporting or anybody soliciting volunteers you know, needs to be up to date on this stuff. And it's really just a matter of, you know, communication with your own vet and the vet in the destination state. So once again, um, Health of the animal, that's something you always want to keep in mind. Um, and the health of the transporter and other people, like if you're transporting an SUV, you know, maybe you haul your own animals in that SUV, maybe you haul your kids around in that SUV. Um, if it's a trailer, you know, if it's a trailer that belongs to a sanctuary, um, remember they're going to transport their animals in that next. So you wanna make sure that you know of any health issues and that they know and that the trailer can be properly sanitized afterwards. Um, and then um, I guess another thing with, uh, I've done a lot of transport and some of them have been you know, really long distances, um, not all the way across country, but you know, I've done like to Texas. And, um, and I'm in South Carolina, so that, that's a long way. You know, it's, it's more than you really want to drive in a day. Um, I really am not a big fan of this. I know people want to place animals wherever they can, but I've seen too much the impact that it has on the animal and how stressful it actually is. And it's very stressful. So um, I really think, you know, placing animals locally is ideal. If I'm choosing between two different places and one is closer than the other and everything else is roughly equal, then I'm gonna go with the close place. Um, so another thing is temperature. Um, this is a big deal with pigs in particular because they don't sweat and they don't regulate their temperature that well. They get hot, they overheat very easily. 
Um, so I always look at what the weather is going to be like and adjust time when I'm transporting and what vehicle I'm using, um, making sure that I have, if it's hot, you know, good ventilation for them. Um, and, you know, if it's if it's too hot, then they need to go in an enclosed vehicle with uh, climate control. Same thing with the cold. Um, just extreme temperatures will just add to the stress, um, particularly with pigs. Um, the pig can have a heart attack or heat stroke. Um, and emotional stress, even when you're taking an animal from a bad place, it's, it's, a lot of times they're still upset to leave. It's the only place they've known. You know, with pigs, they show a lot of emotion. So, you know, I'll take a pig out of someplace pretty bad and, you know, load them up in the trailer and I'll drive a little ways and then I'll stop to check on them and see how they're doing. And there's that pig back there crying. Pigs do cry. Uh, they actually kind of sob. It's heartbreaking to see, but they don't know what's happening. And um, so I, I think, you know, it's, it's something to just be aware of um, that, that transporting an animal is really hard on the animal. You want to make it as comfortable as possible for them and take out the other stressors, you know, as much as you can. So if the pig's going to be upset about leaving, then you know, make sure they're not also dealing with heat and cold. And um, there's also you know certain health conditions they may have, which would make them more susceptible to stress or more susceptible to problems with the temperature. Um, particularly um, with pigs, we often deal with obese animals, but it would also be true for an um, undernourished animal that they would you know be they would need more climate control, or you'd have to be more aware of how hot or how cold it is. Okay, so that's, um, I think that's all I wanted to touch on with transport. So I'm gonna move on to another really sad case study and I can go through these slides quickly. Um, so these pigs we have, um, I'm gonna just show quickly six pigs. Um, the original case, um, well, there's more than one group of pigs, but um, there was a group of four pigs originally rescued in back in 2015. So this case actually um, covers six years. And um, the original rescue, um, there was a small sanctuary involved and there was a larger organization that doesn't have any physical presence in the United States, but does work with um, placement and rehoming and fundraising and things like that. And they're pretty effective that way. Um, so the small sanctuary actually did the rescue and took in the pigs and the large organization um, fundraised for them and you know the pigs were all spayed and neutered. Um, then um, in 2018, this small sanctuary, um, the, the owner became unable to care for the pigs uh, due to some health issues. Um, she didn't feel like she could safely work around large pigs. These are all farm pigs, full grown by this point. Um, so she reached out to um, some to the original organization and to some other rescuers. I was one of them, and um, I, at that point, I declined to help her place the pigs at that time. So um, when we're learning from past mistakes, maybe I should have made a different decision. But I didn't feel like I was capable of doing it at the time. Um, but another rescuer um, that we both know um, did help her to place the pigs and they were placed with a horse rescue. Now, um, I don't know a lot of details about what kind of vetting was done on the placement at the time, 
But what I do know is that in 2020, uh, the horse rescue started reaching out back to the original sanctuary and the larger organization and um, was wanting to rehome the pigs. Um, apparently, they were getting out. And meanwhile, uh, that same horse rescue had taken in um, a few more pigs. So there were eight total on the property at this point. So they were wanting to rehome most or all of the pigs. And I know that there was an attempt made to rehome them, but um, farm pigs can be really hard to place. So um, nobody stepped up. And I think as Sarah might've mentioned, once, once a pig is it, at a rescue, people tend not to see the urgency in placing these pigs. So no home was found and there wasn't a lot of follow-up there in 2020. So um, we move forward to 2021 and um, the horse rescue reached out to a few sanctuaries, including I think the original sanctuary um, and some others like kind of local set horse rescue. And um, at this point, they're telling a story to these other sanctuaries that they're reaching out to is that the story is that the pigs were abandoned on the property by a farmer and that they were there when they bought the property and they have kindly taken care of them for these years, but they need to be gone. Um, about five days after that happened, a vet who um, has some sanctuaries as clients and was a vet who treated these pigs for the horse rescue, um, reached out to some sanctuaries, a lot of the same sanctuaries, um, saying that, um, that the owner was possibly going to euthanize these pigs. And um, the story was that they were being rezoned where they were. So not the same story necessarily about them being abandoned, but um, that they were being rezoned. Um, so one of these rescues that the vet reached out to um, was somebody I know, and she reached out to me. So that was on a Tuesday, and um, I found out who the horse rescue was and immediately reached out to see if I could rehome the pigs. It took about a day for her to get back to me with the pictures and information on the pigs, but she did, and I posted them to social media. Um, so we fast forward. Um, by that evening, I had some good leads. I you know, I'd had some people reach out, and I had personally reached out, not just on social media, but privately to a few different rescues. And definitely at this point, um, you know, nobody wanted to see them euthanized. So we, we had options. And I let her know that. And um, by Thursday, I was also had some non-sanctuary options. And um, I was in the process of checking zoning and arranging farm visits. And, uh, but the same day, the horse rescue told me that, oh, she's got a home. Um, she said she basically already placed, of the original eight, had already placed two and now had a home for five with another horse rescue. They have a hundred acres, it'll be great. And the place that took the remaining, the, the first two will probably take the remaining one. So bye, I don't need you. And, um, you know, I kind of said, well, I've got places. I said, you know, I've got places lined up, but if you're really comfortable with this, you know, I didn't have any claim against these pigs because they were never mine. But um, the next day, um, a sanctuary reached out to me and asked me if I could confirm that the pigs were still alive. And I said, well, I think so. And she said, well, I've heard that they were, that they were euthanized. And so um, I was able through another person uh, who was a client of the vet to reach out to the vet. And the vet did confirm that five of the pigs were euthanized. Um, so this is a pretty horrific story. And um, so per the vet, the remaining three were placed, but um, when I called the original sanctuary, my first 
my first move um, was to inform all of these organizations, none of whom knew that the pigs had been euthanized, and all of whom knew that I was working to rehome them, and some of whom were willing to take them in, at least temporarily. Um, so all those people needed to be notified. Plus, these pigs, some of these pigs actually had sponsors who were paying a monthly fee to sponsor these pigs, so they had to be notified. Um, and then I posted to social media, which, because um, I was very angry and I called out the rescue, the horse rescue by name. Uh, this was probably a mistake because the original sanctuary had them called the sheriff's department. Um, here's where paperwork comes into play. Um, there had never been a surrender form surrendering these pigs to the horse rescue. So um, the original sanctuary basically claimed they still own them and wanted the sheriff's department to go out and see uh, where their pigs were. Um, and animal control went out and found two pigs still on the property. Um, so I guess at this point, I thought there were no pigs. When I posted to social media, I thought there were no pigs on the property. I should have had better confirmation of that before posting because at this point, Everybody was going crazy. People were calling this horse rescue, um, being very nasty, possibly death threats. I don't know about that, but that's what I was told. Um, the vet actually reached back out and said, you know, you need to get people to back off. So yeah, death threats don't help the animals, um, no matter how angry you are. Um, anyway, so we didn't make a lot of efforts to try to make contact and see if somebody could get the remaining pigs out. Once I had posted to social media, I was out. There was no way this woman was going to talk to me, uh, which is why it was a mistake to do it as quickly as I did. Um, but we tried to go through some back doors, um, through the vet, through some other rescues, through some horse people who knew her. Um, nothing was successful. and. Um, so the pigs, to the best of my knowledge, um, and this really only happened a few weeks ago, the pigs remain there on the property, uh, at least two of them. We have one that's unaccounted for. So um, what did we learn from that fiasco? And that was a fiasco. Um, so first of all, when they were placed there in 2018, um, you know, one of the, the woman that owns a horse rescue used a lot of different stories about, uh, oh, we're being rezoned, or she's like, oh, well, we weren't zoned for them to begin with, or our fencing is bad. Well, um, from the pictures I saw, the fencing was bad. So I think, you know, it might be true that they were getting out. Um, she says they were, you know, the neighbors were complaining, may or may not be true. Um, Pretty sure the zoning was not really a problem, but it would have been good if it was been actually checked. Um, and so, you know, when I'm screening, I do my best to check the zoning myself instead of taking somebody's word for it. Um, checking the fencing, this should have been done. Uh, there were numerous opportunities to do it. One would be if a farm visit was scheduled. Uh, before the pigs were transported there. And the second time is when the pigs were dropped off there. You know, if you're a transporter and you see inadequate conditions, um, it's a good idea not to leave the animals there. It, it puts you in a tight spot, but um, it's better than leaving them someplace where they're not going to be safe. Um, so another place is, you know, in 2020, there were people um, who knew they needed to be rehomed again. I didn't know at that point, but um, there could have been more follow through there. And if the fencing was a problem, also, you know, reaching out to like local rescuers and vegan groups and getting a crew to help fix some fencing. It's not that hard to do. It does take some money. Um, the original organization that fundraised for the spays and neuters, when I was trying to rehome them this year, was willing to raise money for a receiving sanctuary to fix fencing. But as far as I know, back in 2020, 
that was not brought up as a possibility. Um, so another thing is I think because this was, this horse rescue was a 501c3 nonprofit animal rescue. I don't think anybody really took the threats to euthanize, even though the person said repeatedly that they were going to euthanize them. I don't think anybody took it very seriously. So um, I think you need to understand that a rescue is not always a safe haven for an animal. Rescues will do bad things sometimes. And, um, you know, especially when they get in over their heads. And there's kind of a, a safe, a face saving thing. They, they, they don't really even want to like go out and publicly say they're needing to rehome. So there is this risk of them doing something kind of quietly on the side. Um, you know, I don't actually know when these animals were euthanized. It could have been before, you know, I even really got involved and she was just kind of playing a game to look good of cooperating with, um, with the rehoming. I have no idea. Um, so one of the things that I think I could have done differently um, if I had realized that we had such a short time frame because it was really only a matter of a couple days before the animals were gone. Um, if I'd known that, I might have suggested that she surrender them to animal control to get them off the property immediately. Um, this is a very risky thing to do, so I do want to talk a little bit about working with animal control. Um, Sarah mentioned it a little bit because they do have, um, in North Carolina, which is where this is happening, they do have a state law that um, animals that are traditionally livestock uh, are supposed to be auctioned off. Now, I've worked with the animal control at a number of different counties in North Carolina, and most of them will ignore that law, but some of them won't. Now, it happens that I had worked with this county animal control before with pigs, with farm pigs, and they had let me pull, uh, do a rescue pull on an animal without the animal actually going through an auction process. So in this case, it might have been a safer option than trying to leave them on the property while they're being home. Um, Hard to say because the animal control there doesn't have a lot of facilities to keep pigs. So, you know, one or two they could do that big a group. I don't know how it would have worked out, but um, probably would have worked out better than what actually happened. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind, but you have to know, um, and you just have to know by experience how a certain county animal control is going to operate and how they're going to act. And um, Like I said, in this case, I had a good experience with that county, um, but with other counties, I know that they're going to go through the auction thing and with big farm pigs, that can be a lot more risky um, because people will try to buy them to eat. Um, so um, the other thing that I should have done that was a big mistake was waited uh, to call this rescue out on social media and to post this about the euthanasia because um, I should have gotten confirmation that there were no animals left on the property. And it turned out, um, I found out the next day that there were a couple there. And so I put my chances of being able to rescue those animals at jeopardy by um, going public with what happened. So if I had to do it over, I wouldn't do that. Um, and I did want to talk about um, screening. So as one of the lessons to take away, um, when, you're, when you're trying to find placement for an animal, um, you have to screen very carefully, whether it's a private home or a private sanctuary, or even if it's a 501c3 sanctuary, you still have to screen them. And it doesn't matter if it's a vegan sanctuary. These calves that ended up with a bad result, those were at a vegan sanctuary. They didn't get vet care soon enough. Most of them died. You know, these pigs were at a 501c3 horse rescue. 
they had a bad result. So, you know, if you're trying to find a home and somebody says, oh, I have a sanctuary, I'll take them. Don't just say, oh yeah, great. Or if they say, we're a vegan sanctuary, we'll take them. You still have to ask all the questions that you would ask if it was just some stranger offering to take them. You need to know, now most people who do a lot of placement will have some kind of application worked up. Um, so I know in the past when I've done it, I've had like an online form that people can fill out. But you never get enough information off of that. So you, you know, it's, it's a nice little piece of, um, you know, paperwork to have or some kind of record of, you know, who applied and, and what they said. But you don't rely on that application. What you really need to do is have a conversation and ask the questions. And as you have the conversation, you can, you'll start to realize what you need to be asking. You know, how much land do they have? You know, how many animals are on that land? How many of that species? What size pasture do your pigs have? Try to get an idea of, you know, how many pigs they have on how many acres and think, do they have any grass? Figure out what your own standards are for what kind of place you want for the animal that you're placing. Um, ask what happens if something happens to them, if they get ill, if they die suddenly. You know, do they have provisions made for their sanctuary, um, you know, a succession plan or they have funds set aside for the care of those animals. And by all means, get somebody to visit the property. If it's at all possible. If it's not possible, um, there are some things you can do. You know, the virtual visit by uh, Google Maps, Google Earth. But ideally, you get somebody there. And I know it's hard to do because you're placing animals sometimes in a place that's a long way away. But this is where you reach out to other rescuers and work collaboratively. And if you have a friend who's closer than you are, you ask that friend, hey, can you go to this place? And if a place doesn't let you on the property to do that visit, then you don't place an animal there. So um, once again, consider involving animal control, but be careful and know what their policies are. And be very careful with um, how you're relating to the person and what you say on social media. And in general, with any rescue on social media, um, ask, no matter what anybody else's role is, if they're helping you load, if they're loaning you equipment, if they're the destination sanctuary, ask them before you use their name on social media, uh, because there are delicate situations. I mean, I know everybody likes to put the nice story up for a successful rescue, you know, up on Facebook or Instagram, but um, please, before you tag people and name names, even if it's a positive result, ask permission from everybody involved. So you don't accidentally say something and reveal something sensitive and jeopardize the whole thing. Okay, happy story. There's a pig named Henry. So I did say that in this sad story, I had worked with that animal rescue, that county, and the animal control for that county. And that is living proof. That's a pig that was pulled from that animal control. Uh, that was in the fall of 2019, I believe. And it was a great example of a collaborative rescue. Um, there was a sanctuary that um, is in that locality that the animal control had reached out to. They weren't able to take in a pig at that point, but they reached out to some other people. And um, so we had a bunch of people work together. Um, another sanctuary came in who was a 501c3 and we worked to um, get the rescue pull because you really do need to pull an animal from animal control. You do need to be a 501c3 and you need to go through this process that they have. And um, so, so a 501c3 went through that, but we had another home lined up that was a private sanctuary, a really nice place that is a nonprofit now, but wasn't at that time. And so all these people working together and I did the transport and happy story, happily ever after. Uh, this is another one that uh, had a bunch of people involved. And um, this is a pig, this is actually how I met Trey for the first time. 
Um, her name is Sunshine. Uh, she currently lives at Changing Hearts Farm in Boiling Springs, North Carolina. And this picture was taken when, um, shortly after her rescue, she's on the way to the University of Tennessee. Uh, she had a severe prolapse, so she is going to undergo surgery when she went there. Um, but once again, this was a place, uh, a rescue where a number of people worked together. Um, I think Trey was the one who heard about this pig and reached out to people. Um, and one sanctuary was going to take the pig in and they needed transport. Uh, Changing Hearts stepped in offering the use of the trailer and I volunteered to do the transport. And um, she went to the local vet first thing and um, her situation was a little more severe than we originally thought. She ended up having to go to the University of Tennessee to be treated and she got spayed while she was there. Um, over the next year, she went to the University of Tennessee four times. I was her personal chauffeur for each visit. Um, a wonderful pig after the first transport, she just, I mean, I can, I can pull the trailer up to her gate and she just jumps in. She knows where she's going. And she's so smart and this is where I'm gonna end because um, when they talk about pigs, um, you might have heard that a pig is as intelligent as a three-year-old child. And I don't know how many of you out there have kids. I don't, but um, the last time I took this pig to the University of Tennessee, so the fourth trip, when I pulled up in front of her gate, before she got on the trailer, she stopped and peed. And I thought, oh, hmm, okay, and then she just hopped on. And then when I went to pick her up from the University of Tennessee, as she's coming out, they've got like this kind of chute the animal can walk out and then she gets on the trailer. Before she got to the trailer, she stopped and she peed and she pooped. And I was like, oh, wait. <laughs> and sure enough, she gets home. It's a four hour trip one way. She gets home and her straw, her bedding is completely clean. This pig has figured out when she gets in the trailer, she has a four hour drive. And if she pees and poops before she gets on the trailer, she won't mess up her bedding. And I just think that's so smart. And I want to ask for any of you who have kids, how old was your kid before without any prompting on your part, they would use the bathroom before going on a four hour car ride. <laughs> so anyway, that's Sunshine. She's really great pig, really, really smart. And that's just, you know, what's so special. All right. That's it. I'm going to, let's see if I can get back to um, not sharing anymore. <laughs> okay, I think I probably went over my allotted time. I'm sorry, but. Thank you, Melissa. Now that was really wonderful. Um, I mean, your, your dedication, experience, knowledge, and passion absolutely shines through and what common sense advice you were able to give. So I'm gonna open it up to questions now for both of our presenters. So let us know if, if your sp question specific to one or the other, or if it's for either or both. And I guess, and Trey might help me with any of the questions that went into the chat, but I'm gonna look for whoever might have their hand up, I, I think, if you wanna ask the question verbally and I'll call on you. So I guess you have to put your video on. I see, oh, Julia Novak, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. So uh, my question would be, whose job is it to do the um, research work? Uh, Cause I, so like, is it the coordinating people or if there's a rescue already set up, is it the transporter's job to go back and then redo the checks or make sure all that work is done because I've done a rescue or transport and um, you know, I just, I figured that the two sanctuaries who were vegan, as far as I knew, it was all good. Um, but now I'm thinking I should have checked even though I was just the transporter. So I'm just, whose job is it to do that when? Yeah. Sarah, do you have an answer to that or? Yeah, so yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there's obviously a lot of pieces to the puzzle of an animal rescue. Um, so I consider that person that's kind of over all the little pieces and making sure they connect 
um, appropriately would be the advocate for that animal. So sometimes that's the, um, if I hear of a case and I'm like, I'm gonna try to be this animal's advocate, or I might just be able to hit the share button and be like, I'm gonna network for this animal, but I can't really like coordinate this rescue thoroughly. Um, that role would need to go to somebody really experienced. Um, and that's where mentorship is so important. Um, people like Trey that do really amazing in this work of understanding kind of how they all need to fit together. Um, in that case that you experienced, um, Julia, like as a transporter, that wouldn't be something a responsibility would fall on you if something didn't go smoothly. Like I wouldn't consider the transporter accountable for those situations, but anytime I'm involved as a nonprofit animal rescue, if um, our name's being thrown out or if I'm saying I'm going to be involved in the rescue, I do try to like look at all those different pieces and kind of keep up with it. But yeah, I would say that's who is taking charge of advocating for that particular rescue. Thank you very much. One quick just question to that. Do you think it's out of line for the transporter to get involved and make sure that someone has gone there? Do you think it's like um, appropriate if the advocate, or even if there is an advocate, but just to kind of see if all of that has been done or is that inappropriate for the- Yeah. Cool. No, that's not at all inappropriate. Questions are never inappropriate. You're volunteering your time. Um, you're believing in this rescue and you should be able to ask questions and they should say, um, so-and-so is who vetted and screened this person in this potential home. And these are the standards that they um, use to screen this home. And there should be full transparency and a lot of checks and balances so that if like one person's missing something and messing up, like another person can check in and be like, hey, like, did you know that so-and-so is actually really struggling financially right now? Maybe this wasn't the best home. And not saying that that can't get complicated sometimes, but like questions, even as a transporter, as a donor to a fundraiser, like questions are never bad and are never inappropriate. I'd like to address this too a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, so, you know, a lot of times when you're transporting, you're the only one who sees the destination. Um, so as a transporter, I do reserve the right to veto the destination if I get there and it's bad. Um, you know, I do, because my work has been a little more integrated with the, um, the placement and networking and other, you know, parts of the rescue. Um, most of the time I'm not like transporting only and I'm involved in maybe more than one level. And I would just say that there's not ever like a one size fits all on this um, because the way the different pieces put together and how involved each person is, is going to vary from one rescue to another. So um, as a transporter, you might be more involved with other aspects in one rescue and with another, you know, yep, you're just, going from point A to point B. And it's, it's gonna be different every time. Thank you, Melissa. So there's a question from Wilma from earlier. She does transport. I think this is for Melissa because she brought it up. What are some of the examples of sicknesses that animals can, can give to humans? Um, salmonella, E. coli, uh, cryptosporidium, um, those are, those are like the big ones, a lot of digestive ones. Um, and you know, there can be some respiratory infections as well that can transmit. Um, so that's one. Okay. Know, Does that answer your question? Wilma? Oh, and I, I guess I would say like, you know, if you do need to handle the animal and you know, the animal is sick, um, you know, hopefully everybody's already carrying hand sanitizer lately in, in their vehicle. So <laughs> sanitize up. And, you know, if you have like some gloves or anything, you know, we all have masks. So. Okay. Common okay. supplies I, we all have now. Yeah. I always volunteer at a sanctuary and, and I never use any precautions or anything, you know, gloves or anything. So. Um. <laughs> Good advice then, right? Yeah. Well, at a, at a sanctuary, one would hope you're dealing with healthy animals. So it's, it's generally more a uh, transport consideration. 
You know, in most sanctuaries, when the animal's there, they, they will have a quarantine space and a quarantine period uh, before the animal's in the general population. But um, yeah, but when you're transporting uh, your animals coming from an unknown situation and you might not know the health, or you might know that there is a problem, and that's when you really need to be careful. Okay. So there's a question from Groovy Fat Vegan. Uh, when would it be appropriate, if at all, I guess, to pay to save an animal? Sarah, your take? Um, regarding paying, so everybody kind of has their own standard and ethical line they draw. Um, like I said, because we operate as a 501c3 and we have limited funds, we just go ahead and draw that line at um, we are not going to pay for the animal. But like I said, there's really zero judgment, like all of you with companion animals at home, if it was like, I have to pay to save their life right now, like, of course you would. And each animal is equally deserving of that. And a lot of individuals will go out and purchase the animals off Craigslist or at auctions or whatever. And that's how a lot of them do reach sanctuary and it's totally worth it. So I really can't put like a yes or no on this and just say, that's just where all of us have to figure out kind of where to draw that line. And for me, it's just not purchasing animals. Well, I think there is one instance that Sarah and I both agree where it's okay. Um, and that is when it's through animal control and they're required to auction the animal, um, paying at the animal control auction, because um, they're not paying for a breeder, you know, who's going to go breed more the money actually goes back to the county and the shelter. Um, so that's one exception that I would make. Excellent, thank you so much. There's another question in the chat from Kirsten. How can I make sure I'm supporting an ethical animal rescue or sanctuary? Since there's so many titles like animal conservation, natural rescue and more, is there a difference? What can people you know, watch for? And I know you have to vet them certainly anyway. Sarah? Um, well, when at all possible, I would say visiting the sanctuary because there's a way to make them appear online, you know, taking the right pictures and it might look like a really great situation. And then when you pay them a visit, it turns out totally different. Um, and also if a sanctuary isn't open to visitors, I'm not saying it's going to be a horrific situation because of that. There's a lot of different reasons they might not have the time um, to cater to visitors, but I do think that transparency is really crucial. They should definitely be open to home checks for animals that are potentially coming there. Um, there are like certain kind of like badges and criteria you can go through to be like legitimized, but that's not necessarily there's not really like a universal like gold stamp on this type of thing. And we all have our own standards of like what it might look like to provide optimum care. And then another thing you have to realize if you've never done farm animal rescue is like, um, you know, what's that line? Like you're pulling them from a horrific situation and saving them from death or slaughter. And then maybe the situation somebody can provide is an ideal, but it's like so much better. It's so much of an increase in quality of life because it's a life period. Um, and then at what point is it like, well, maybe euthanasia is better than this because they can't provide lifelong veterinary care. You need to know that they absolutely have a plan for um, continuing with funding, getting animals medical treatment because it's not just about getting them to a safe space. They're gonna require very specialized care. A lot of times it looks like a hospice situation. You're having to pay for a lot of um, medical stuff at end of life. So unfortunately, like most things, there's just not a right and wrong answer. And you just have to kind of embark on this and explore and talk to other people and see what their experiences are with the sanctuary. Thank you. Okay, Melissa, anything to add or should we leave it at that? So, um, Dina? Has, no, I don't have anything to add to that. Sorry. Okay. Um, Dina wanted to ask a question about sanctuaries. Dina, you can unmute yourself. You're still here. Hi, Michelle. Thank you. Hi, everybody. 
I would, yeah, I'd like to know a little bit more about um, spreading the, the uh, word about um, visiting sanctuaries. Here in Ontario and Canada, we're getting to know the um, Animal Activism Network and vegan communities are growing rapidly. And we're getting to know a lot of people who own and run sanctuaries personally. And we would like to find ways to shuttle people there. As um, um, Melissa was saying, once you do meet the, the animal, was it Melissa or, um, yeah, once you do meet the animals, it makes all the difference. They do the talking. We, we're, we're looking to turn the animals into their, their own advocates. So we've had a chance to visit a few and um, it, it turns into sponsoring them once you meet them turns into a ripple effect of telling people about your experience. So it, do you have any um, formal transport or shuttle operations in any of your states or, or you know of where it's a little organized like that? Or is it just up to people to come and visit by looking at, your, uh, looking at the websites of sanctuaries and, and booking a visit? Sarah? And then Melissa? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. Um, visiting these sanctuaries is so important. And even though it can take up a lot of time to coordinate visitations, um, I know I personally don't say no to anybody. And that has taken up a lot more time of mine during COVID where I can't just say, okay, everybody comes on Saturdays or this, this day each month and do like a big visitation group and I'm doing more personal tours, so it takes up a lot more time. Um, as far as like shuttle options, we don't really have anything organized like to and from the city, but we do have groups that come and they'll come in a bus, um, or we do ask people to carpool because we have limited parking and most sanctuaries that are in these like farm rural areas like aren't going to have a ton of parking. So yeah, we encourage carpooling and we have groups that come out and they coordinate and meet together in Asheville and then come to our farm location. Um, but yeah, if you've got these rescued farm animals, even if you're a personal rescuer that has some backyard farm companion animals, like allowing the public to interact is like such an important experience. And I don't say no to people because there might be somebody that goes vegan because of a visit or turns into a big donor and is so helpful, you know, with like monetarily and just, you just don't really want to decline people. So I definitely would encourage um, anyone rescuing farm animals to set up a system that works for them. There's also a whole other thing with liability and signing waivers that you would want to get into. So if that animal hurt someone, um, you also have to consider biosecurity. You know, Melissa went into this a lot and people come into and from your farm and how to make that um, not like make that a secure experience for them. So there's definitely a lot to consider when you have visitors, but it's um, definitely a worthwhile thing to do. Thank you. Oh, okay. thank you, Sarah. Great. So we're going to have to wrap it up shortly. So I guess maybe just one more kind of quick mm -hmm. question. Does anybody have? Uh, raise your hand. I've got a question. Dana? No one else does. All right. Maybe two more questions. <laughs> Dana, do you want to unmute? Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I typed it out, but I like started rambling and I stopped it. But anyway, so you can't have a, a like a big pig at your house unless you have if you unless you're in a special location, right? Because I think I looked up roosters, and I think I live in Atlanta. I think that you couldn't have roosters here, and I think you couldn't have potbelly pigs. Is that correct? I, I don't know much about this. I'm just curious. I can talk a little bit about zoning because I do a lot of checking of zoning. And it's, it varies. I mean, it varies like plot to plot. You can't even look it up by zip code. Like everybody in the same zip code will be the same. It can be specific to your own neighborhood. Sometimes it'll be a citywide ordinance um, or in your town and they won't, yeah, some places don't allow roosters. And um, with the pigs, even potbelly pigs are generally considered livestock by zoning, but not always. Some places will consider them exotic pets 
So the rules, you, you really have to look at your own zoning board and find it for your specific lot. It's that, it's that tight. Like, so I can't tell you like in your city what the law is because it could vary neighborhood to neighborhood. And, you know, and out in the country still, like there could be a subdivision where things aren't allowed. And then, you know, other places, everything's allowed. Yeah. So that's, that's something you're gonna have to research. It's gonna be very specific to you. Gonna have Thank to you. do your homework, look it up. Excellent, very good. Trey, do you have a, a last question, quick question? Yeah, and I'm sorry, I know we're going over, but there, there's two really important things I wanna, I wanna ask about. Um, one is if one of you or both of you could just talk about like some of the, um, I guess like unwritten etiquette of rescue. Like if, if I come across an animal and I wanna rescue that animal, what would be like the good steps for me to take if I wanna rescue that animal um, that would be in everybody's best interest? And then the second question is, if you've ever experienced any situations where rescuing became more like enabling someone to abuse animals. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if anybody wants to talk about any of that, I just think those are two important things. Sarah? Um, yeah, I'll start. Um, so thank you for that question. That's why I've always loved Trey as um, a rescuer and advocate is he's so aware of this and um, he would be a really great mentor for all of you out there wanting to kind of dabble in advocating for an animal. But um, some of the etiquette as a sanctuary that I would want to talk about is like social media is so tricky and posting and sharing and like knowing when to talk about a story also making sure you're not posting about that animal and not giving credit to the final home. So, you know, if I am placing an animal, I'm always going to talk about their destination if that place wants it. Um, so like constant communication with all the people is so important here and kind of figuring out where everybody stands, what they want to talk about, what they don't want to talk about. Um, and the second part to that, as far as like perpetuating the problem, I'm sure all of us have like crossed the line into this, but yeah, I've definitely taken animals that have been like pardoned from slaughter. And then I've seen the flip side where they, you know, really build this story up and make themselves heroes. And then people like support that farm because of this cute little story. And it's like, what do you do there? Because if you had refused to take the animal, they just would slaughter them. So um, that's where I think it's important to realize you do control the narrative for the remainder of their life. And sometimes it's, it's a hard pill to swallow, but like sometimes the end goal of getting the animal to safety is so much more important than being right. And you're not always going to be able to just immediately like, you know, kill this whole uh, system of animal exploitation. So yeah, it's a, it's a hard line to draw. And sometimes you don't, you cross it and then you've got to like reel it back in and it's really easy to do. Thank you. Yeah, I can, I can address that too. I think like with the etiquette, um, I agree with Sarah, like social media is a big thing. You want to give everybody credit who wants credit, but you also need to protect privacy. Um, of people who don't want to be named. And sometimes, you know, there's situations where a rescue is really delicate and it's, you know, obviously the, the sanctuary that's the destination home is, you know, that's the real rescue. That's where you want to give the bulk of the credit. But sometimes you don't want to reveal that home because it might put the sanctuary owner or the animal at risk. Because uh, sometimes people are angry about a rescue. <laughs> so, um, so that can happen. I mean, and with animal control, by the way, they usually have a policy that where they will not reveal where the animal goes. And there's a good reason for that policy uh, because sometimes somebody wants the animal for meat, and they send it to a sanctuary. If they release the name of the sanctuary, you know, somebody could come after that person. So I just think, ask, you know, ask the question, ask everybody involved if they want to be named, or they want to Facebook post, you know, and, so asking is always like a really good thing. As far as enabling, I mean, what Sarah said is right. 
um, in terms of like rescuing from farms and stuff. And, you know, I've certainly done that. Um, and um, yeah, and I, I've had a pot belly pig breeder like contact me wanting me to find homes for the pigs she couldn't sell. And, and she's like, oh, I'm so glad to know you're there. I can, I can contact you about all my unsold pigs. Well, <laughs> that didn't go over well. I'm going to say I lost it with that woman. I totally lost my cool. But, um, <laughs> but also on the sanctuary and like, if you see a sanctuary starting to get in over their head, continuing to place animals there is also enabling. Um, you know, and, and I've seen, unfortunately, it happened far too many times where sanctuaries do get in over their heads with taking in too many animals. And so I think, you know, you have an obligation um, if you can see that coming in advance. And I, that's just one of those experience things, I guess, or, you know, use your judgment. But um, so on, on both sides, there's like, it's, it's a really gray area. And I, I don't think any of us has a formula for it, but um, just be very aware and, and you can kind of go with your gut on this. Thank you so much. We're gonna pull the plug on it there, even though I know there's many more questions, but um, we wanna wrap it up and thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Melissa, so much for presenting tonight and for your part in securing freedom and loving homes for animals who are so desperately in need. I'm sure Sarah won't say no if I say that she could use donations, I'm sure. Donate to a Farmshire Sanctuary um, in North Carolina. That's farmshire.org, that's in the chat. Um, so again, this has been brought to you by AAM, Animal Activism Mentorship. Please like our page and join our a private community group, go to our website, share our website, subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Follow us on Instagram and TikTok. And I have a couple of upcoming workshops, our next two workshops. All of our workshops are free and offered through Zoom. The next one is Spirituality, Religion, and Veganism on Tuesday, April 6th at 7 p.m. The following is going to be Amplifying Animal Voices on Tuesday, April 13th, also at 7 p.m. You can find all the details on our page and our group, our group page and our, um, our cause page. And also, finally, we have an Animal Liberation Tour of Florida going on May 29th through June 6th. We'd love to have you donate to, to support the activists or come with us. Trey, do you want to say anything else about the Florida tour? I will try. My dogs are freaking out right now. <laughs> or not. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the Animal Liberation Tour is in Florida, and it'll be May 29th through June 6th. Um, there's an event page for it uh, on Animal Activism Mentorship's Facebook page. And um, this tour is really going to be centered around getting people active. So if you're experienced... If you've never been to an activism event before in your life, whatever level you're at, um, you know, we're going to meet you where you are. If you need guidance, we're going to provide that for you uh, every step of the way. That's what it's all about um, through mentorship and through hands on experience with with activism. So the one in Florida, um, there's going to be uh, some protests, demos, a march, um, some focus on Sea Life, um, I think most of us have seen Sea Spiracy on Netflix by now and realize how dire the situation is with, with, uh, with our oceans and with sea life. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be quiet now because my dogs are freaking out, but uh, please check out the event page uh, on Animal Activism Mentorship's Facebook page under the events tab. Thank you, Trey. I think we covered everything. I hope so. If you have other questions, feel free to, to, to reach out to us by email or through social media. But thank you, everybody who came out and joined us tonight. And um, go out, we can't just say go out and save animals. Take everything into consideration that you've heard tonight. And yes, do continue to support the rescue <laughs> and the sanctuaries. The sanctuaries need your, need your support for sure. And go vegan if you're not already vegan. Thank you for joining us. Good night. <laughs>